folks. Welcome to the third installment of Branch Lines of the NNW. In this episode, I'll be discussing the history of the Lavasa branch and the interesting story of how it came into being. If you've watched my YouTube channel, you know by now that this is my favorite branch. I spent the first 10 years of my life living just east of Mall Post 4 at the state line. Let's get started. The Lavisa branch splits off the Buchanan branch mainline at Thomas Y and turns west along the Lavisa River and runs about 13 miles to the community of Biggs, Kentucky. The picture here is uh, NSU 58 diverging off the Buchanan branch mainline onto the Lavisa branch with 120 Kyber empties. W.J. Stacy was the engineer. Frank Crow took the picture. I appreciate him letting me use it. The story of the Levisa branch actually began before the N&W came into the area. The Ritter, Lumberon, Big Sandy, and Cumberland Railroad originally laid the track from Thomas Y. West to about milepost 3. The B.S. and C. utilized the line for hauling raw lumber. After the N&W's takeover of the B.S. and C., tracks were extended about a mile west to the Kentucky-Virginia state line. Tracks formally ended right at the side of the state line number 2 road crossing. One important piece of the puzzle here is the fact that the CNO had graded a right of way up from Biggs to a point just west of the end of the NW tracks near the state line as part of their proposed Levisa subdivision. The CNO trackage ended down at the Kentland Elkhorn Mine, which is pictured above, and is also almost inside of today's Kyber operation. The CNO never laid any track west of there. Rumor has it they only done it to keep the NW from gaining access to the vast coal reserves along the Levisa River into Kentucky. By the early 1940s, mines located along the proposed CNO line were trucking their coal to the docks on the Virginia side for loading on the NW. On October 7, 1943, the NW filed with the ICC to extend their Levisa branch west into Kentucky. As part of the petition, the NW asked the ICC to revoke the original CNO charter. The CNO charter was granted to them in 1929. Several coal shippers in the area greatly supported this idea. They all wanted direct rail shipments so they wouldn't have to truck the coal up the river to the state line. These shippers also pointed out the fact that it was between 180 to 260 miles shorter than service would have been via the CNO. In other words, the coal companies could save a lot more money by shipping by the NW. Of course, the CNO immediately opposed the NW extension. As soon as the NW filed that petition with the ICC, the CNO started construction. One interesting note here is the fact they started construction near the end of the NW tracks near the state line, as opposed to starting from the end of their existing trackage down at Biggs. This was an obvious attempt to keep the NW out of Kentucky, and it didn't work. On May 4, 1944, the ICC found it would be in the public's best interest for the NW to operate the line between state line and Biggs. All the NW had to do was pay the CNO for the work they'd done to grade the right of way. There were two major factors here that helped the NW win that portion of the line. That was the fact that coal was being trucked out of Kentucky to Virginia to be loaded in NW cars, and that several years went by with CNO doing pretty much nothing to work on the line between Big Creek and State. The NW and CNO did end up working a joint mine down there at Biggs called Kentland Elkhorn. It was owned by Pidston. It was in the picture that uh, I showed y'all earlier. CNO reached the mine via its Levisa main line while the NW reached it via their short second fork spur. The NW got most of the business here because it was 14 cents cheaper to ship by them as compared to the CNO. CNO trains disappeared from the Biggs area altogether in 1965 when the Fish Trap Dam was put in near Millard, Kentucky. The backwaters of Fish Trap Lake ended up covering almost 10 miles of the CNO line. The remainder of the track on the east side of the lake was later leased by the NW to service Apache Coal Company's tipple at Bain and United Coal's Karen tipple at Crescent. Bain was the last to close in 1998, and all remaining CNO tracks were removed from Nida Crescent in 2002. 
the picture here shows an NW shifter shoving loads from Bain up the old CNO track back toward Biggs. That's the CNO mile post there in the center of the picture. All that remains of the CNO trackage today is a short section of the old connection track just east of the Kyber operation and a short section of track on the west side of the lake near the dam. The old CNO trackage was referred to as the Levisa Spur in the NS timetable and was governed under TWC in its last year's operation. The picture above shows a shifter coming off the spur at Bain. That's the old CNO Levisa main line in the foreground. Once off the spur, the train would shove cab first back to the junction with the Levisa branch at Biggs. The early to mid-1980s seemed to be the peak years for coal shipment on the Levisa branch. It was busy enough to constitute having its own crew pool based at a Weller. Here were the 1980s operations in order from Thomas Wye to the end of the line. The first one you'd come to is United Coal Company's plant number 7 at Strick. Referred to as both Buck 1 and Buck 3 on the railroad, this operation began life as the Buchanan County Coal Company's main cleaning plant in the 1940s. That's where the buck names come into play. Old names die hard on the railroad. Why did one operation have two names? Because plant number seven had two separate loading points. The first utilized the old Buchanan County Coal Outlet on the north side of the Levisa branch. This consisted of four tracks and cars were dropped under the tipple. In the 1970s, after United acquired it, they built a silo and a large yard on the south side of the tracks. These Google Earth images help better understand this layout. They continued to use the Buck 1 side to load single car shipments until 1998, and the Buck 3 side was last used in June of 2016. By the time they shut the plant completely down, much of it had been torn down and United was only using it to load single car shipments. Both the plant and its Alco switchers are still intact and can be viewed from the road crossing at Strick. It's located right at milepost H1. You see Engineer William Stacy taking the U61 down the branch with Kyber empties. The rest of the yard tracks in the foreground is the outlet for Buck 3. This is the last time I ever videoed him working engineer. He flowed back to conductor the following month and has been conductor ever since. Here we see the J80 passing by the Alco switcher. That's the silo for Buck 3 in the background. Just around the curve from Buck 3 is Buck 2. This is United Coal Company's plant number 8. Referred to as Buck 2 on the railroad, this operation was also started by the Buchanan County Coal Company. Unlike Buck 3, Nothing was left of the original Buchanan County Coal operation here. It was here in 1978 that United Coal built their very first large preparation plant. The plant consisted of a large yard and a silo for the loading of unit trains. A smaller loadout was also constructed to load Stoker Coal. Like Buck 3, Buck 2 also utilized an Alco switcher to load their shipments. After United was purchased by Metinvest in 2011, this facility received a number of major upgrades. The yard was all ripped out and a large flood loading silo was constructed here. Buck 2 can load 100 top guns in about 2 hours and is presently the most active loader on the Levisa branch. The next operation you'd come to was Rapoka Energy's Black Watch No. 2 operation at Bayer. Known as Bar No. 2 on the railroad, this small plant sat just around the curve from Buck 2. 
they had a side in here that could probably hold about 20 cars if I had to guess. It closed in the early 1990s after Rapoka was acquired by United and everything was centralized to their plants further up the river. It was reclaimed in 2004 and the siding has been removed. Met Invest currently uses the site to stockpile clean coal for Buck 2 and to store their old equipment. The picture here shows NSU 54 taken a Kyber train east by the former location of the Bar No. 2 tipple. The tipple was located to the left of the train. Inside of bar number two sat the old Billy Thomas dock. Can't remember what the railroad called it. I've really not heard a lot of people talk about it. Conaway, maybe? Anyway, it was a small crush and load facility and shared the siding with bar number two. It could probably hold, I'm guessing, about ten cars at best. This operation was closed in the mid-1980s under the ownership of the Excello Coal Company. It was finally reclaimed in 2009 when Norfolk Southern decided it was a liability to keep on their property. This picture here shows an N.A.W. shifter passing by the dock when it was active. The next one you'd come to was the Potter Coal Company's Margaret Ann operation. Known as Potter on the railroad, this fairly large prep plant set just west of mile post 3. At first the coal came to a plant from a mine located on the south side of the river and in later years it received trucked in coal from area mines. The track layout for this operation was very unique. The siding came off on the south side of the branch and went down into a small bottom. It is a pretty steep grade going down in there if I had to guess about 3%. They had three outlet tracks here, and if I had to guess, they could probably hold about 50 cars altogether, maybe more. It closed in the early 1980s, and everything was gone by 1995. Now today, the switch is gone, but the outlet tracks are still down in the bottom covered up by dirt. I'm sorry I don't have any pictures of the operation. Google Earth didn't have any, and from what I've seen, there's none really that was ever took of it. The next one was Kentucky Berwyn Coal Company's G1 operation at the state line. I think they called it state line on the railroad too. Anyway, G1 sat right beside the state line number one road crossing just east of mile post four. State line had a capacity of about 25 cars and closed in the late 80s or early 90s when everything was centralized to the plant at Biggs. I think G1 was reclaimed in about 2000 or 2001. I do know it was still there when we moved up there from uh, when we moved up to the state line from mouth card. Here we see work train 97W passing the former location of the tip. It was to the left of the train. The next operation you'd come to was the Apache Coal Company's mouth card tipple at mouth card. The mouth card operation set just west of the community of mouth card and featured a belt line crossing over the Levisa River. It looked to be a decent sized operation with room for about 30 cars if I had to guess. It closed in the mid 1980s and was gone by 1990. Here we see the U-54 heading down the branch with empties for Kyber at Mouth Card. This is just east of the former location of the Mouth Card tip. On the right, you can faintly make out where the outlet track come off.
The next mine you come to is the DJB Collieries Feds Creek Mine at Feds Creek, Kentucky. The Feds Creek operation was located about mile post one on the Feds Creek Spur. The Feds Creek Spur used to split off at mile post 8.3 at Feds Creek Junction and run about two miles up the holler. This was a full-size preparation plant and received coal from a mine up on the mountain behind it in early years. By the 1980s, under the ownership of the Apache Coal Company, they were prepping and shipping trucked-in coal from area mines. Feds Creek looked to have had room for about 70 to 80 cars and had a three-track outlet. I'm not sure when the plant closed, but I know it was still listed as active on the 1985 NS Mine Directory. In these 1989 photos by Robert Vaughn, it looked pretty rough. They started reclaiming it in 1994 and everything was gone by the end of the 1990s. The tracks were removed in 2002. I can remember seeing the work train pulling the tracks on my way up to school at the now closed Jackson Row Elementary School up in Feds Creek. I was in kindergarten at the time. The next one you come to was Kyber Coal Company's Biggs Preparation Plant at Biggs. This plant is set at the exact location of the current Clintwood Elkhorn No. 2 operation. The railroaders still call it Kyber. It was a rather large cleaning plant and had a capacity for 78 cars. In the 80s and 90s, it was pulled and delivered every night like clockwork. It continued to load to the late 1990s when Tico acquired the property. They bought it and closed it down and then later tore it down to make way for the current operation we all know today. But then side of the Kyber tip, was Kentland Elkhorn's number two operation. The site was originally constructed in 1946 as the Harmon Mining Company, but was soon changed to Feds Creek Coal Company as the two shared the same president. The desire here was to have an option to ship via the CNO. The legal battles between the NW and CNO resulted in the CNO never getting to extend their tracks that far up the creek, so it remained a sole NW shipper unlike the Kentland Elkhorn No. 1 operation below here. This was the very first shipper on the Kentucky side of the Levisa branch. The two mines that fed the plant were located up on the hillside and were closed in 1987. By the time these photos had been taken in the 1990s, the conveyors had already been demolished and the mines reclaimed. Sometime after it was constructed, it was acquired by Pittston and fell under the Kentland Elkhorn banner. In these pictures here, you could see where the mines were up on the hill. Don't look like they'd been reclaimed awfully long before these pictures were taken. The last loader on the Levisa branch during those times was known as Mudlick. It's unknown to me who the operator was. The mine was higher on the hillside on the opposite side of the tracks and coal was loaded and trucked all of about 300 feet across the road to the tipple. Also of note here, just above here, Georgia Pacific Company utilized a small siding to load finished lumber into flat cars. That was stopped by the mid-1980s. As I mentioned earlier in the video, the N &W ended up with the eastern portion of CNO's Levisa subdivision after the fish trap dam was put in. This required a connection to be built between the two near Dunlap. These Google Earth images here help explain the track layout. There were two operations that the NW worked on the CNO side, and we'll get to them here shortly. The first operation worked by N&W on the CNO side was the Apache Coal Company operation at Bain. Bain was about six miles down the old CNO track and was located on a spur about a quarter mile up Miller's Creek. The spur came off on the north side of the tracks and fanned out into three outlets. Bain had a capacity for about 60 cars and in the early 90s, Shifters would deliver 60 to Bain and 60 to Kyber and return to Weller with 120 loads. Bain was idled in the 1990s but was bought by Clintwood Elkhorn. 
they had a brief resurrection in 1998. Clintwood Elkhorn utilized this to prep their coal while the new tipple was being constructed at the Kyber site. Bain was closed in 1999 and was removed in 2000. The remainder of the Levisa Spur was removed in 2002. This is one of the very few locations I've heard of on the railroad that was haunted. It was to the point where some folks refused to go down there and work this operation at night. One engineer I know still won't talk about what he's seen down in there, but that's another story for another time. Keith Kinzer and my cousin William Stacy delivered the last empties here in 1999. WJ said that when he was tying handbrakes, it was so quiet up in there, all he could hear was the transformers humming on the pole and the heart beating in his chest. No crickets, no frogs, no nothing. He said it felt like a thousand eyes were on him and he wanted to hurry and get the empties tied down and get out of there. The final tipple on the Levisa Spur was United Coal Company's Karen Tipple at Crescent. The Karen operation was located at the very end of the CNO trackage before it sank into the lake near the community of Lick Creek, Kentucky. It looked to be a pretty good sized cleaning plant and probably had a capacity for about 50 or 60 cars. It looked like it was idle in the 1986 historic aerials view and was gone by 1995, and as far as I know, no photos exist of it. The tail track of the Karen tip literally went out into the lake. The Levisa branch to today is a shell of its former self. What was once a busy enough line to constitute having its own crew pool has dwindled to about one train each day. There's presently three active operations on the branch, Buck 2, Kyber, and Big Creek. As I mentioned before, Buck 2 is the most active loader, loading almost every night if empties are available. Kyber loads about one train a week if that. Kyber used to load more in a week than they do in a whole month now. You could always bank on a train going to Kyber each morning. Until about 2013, the only operation on the Buchanan branch that loaded more coal was Consol. Big Creek is the newest operation worked out of Weller. Located just about a half mile west of Kyber, this operation was built in 1998 by Apex Energy. It began operation just a few months after the new Kyber operation. Big Creek used to load one to two trains per week, primarily power plant trains. It was acquired by Cambrian Coal in 2018 and was idle for the whole year of 2019. 2020 has saw a resurgence. Cambrian has been utilizing Big Creek for the flood loading of unit trains. Like before, it has been primarily power plant trains for Mayo, North Carolina. Trains on the Levisa branch operate under Norfolk Southern Rule 171, aka track warrant control. Current track speed is limited to 10 miles an hour due to deteriorating track condition. Catching a train going down the branch has become somewhat of a rarity. Buck 2 trains usually load at night because they block the road crossing at Strick while flood loading. Kyber and Big Creek have been known to go a whole month or longer without loading anything. When empties go down the Levisa, shifter crews usually pick them up on Main 2 at Lynn Camp. Trains going to Buck 2 will get tracked from Strick to State Line, while Kyber and Big Creek trains get from Strick to Curb. If you're ever in the area and you hear either of these on the radio, you better shoot it while you can, especially the Big Creek and Kyber trains. Here's a list of track warrant stations as you head down the branch from Thomas Y. Strick is the end of CTC on the branch and sets just west of milepost 1. Bayer sits just west of milepost 3. State Line is at milepost 4. Feds Creek Junction is at milepost 8.4. And Curb is at milepost 11.5 and is the end of track warrant control. To wrap up this installment of Branch Lines of the N and W, we'll check out some trains on the branch. If you'd like to see more action on the Levisa branch, Check out my Levisa Branch Collection video here on YouTube.
at uh, Lynn Camp. Well, that wraps up this installment of Branch Lines D and W. I'd like to thank Daniel Boyden and Ed Painter for the use of their photos for this, as well as Frank Crow. Robbie Vaughn, man, I couldn't have done this without you. I appreciate the information, and you, I'm telling you, you've got pictures of tipples that nobody else has. Can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Hope y'all enjoyed it. Uh, I'll be doing an update video here before long telling y'all what's going on uh the new buchanan branch dvd with green frog is out and is available for purchase and again i apologize to you guys for being so long putting out a new video hope y'all enjoyed this one and look for more stuff soon hope everybody's staying safe out there